The Buddha recommends two things to do after you've heard the Dharma. And while you're listening to the Dharma, you ask yourself, how does this apply to my mind? In particular, how does this apply to the problem of my mind, which I'm creating suffering for myself? It's called appropriate attention. You take the lessons you learn from the Dharma that you heard in talks, and also from the Dharma you notice just as you go through the day. And you apply them to this problem of suffering. There's a famous incident in John Munn's life. There was a senior monk from Bangkok who was not all that impressed with the forest tradition. His teacher was. And so his teacher would drag him to the northeast to pay respects to John Munn and the other forest Johns. And this city monk was not all that impressed. His attitude was, if he wanted to hear the Dharma, he had to be in Bangkok. That's where all the well-educated Dharma speakers were. So he asked John Munn, here you are out in the woods, how do you, how do you hear the Dharma? Where do you get to hear the Dharma? And John Munn's response was, I hear it 24 hours a day, except for when I'm asleep. A leaf falls. It's a lesson in impermanence. An animal cries. You reflect on suffering. So there are drama lessons all around. The monk from Bangkok said, well, it's obvious you know how to listen to the drama. So you want to learn how to listen to the Dharma, too. You ask yourself, what in this Dharma talk that I'm listening to is applying to my problem of suffering? Or when you see someone else creating suffering, you ask yourself, to what extent do I do it the same way? When you're looking outside, you want to bring it inside. When you're listening outside, to bring it inside. This is where the real Dharma is. It's inside. We tend to think the Dharma is out there in the words that the Buddha left behind, the Ajahn's left behind. But those are just reflections on the Dharma, pointers to the Dharma. There's a Pali term, Dhamma Desana, which they use for Dhamma talk. And Desana literally means to point out. The words point to the Dharma. But the Dharma is a quality of the heart. We're trying to train the heart so it's not so rough with itself. It creates a lot of issues, and the issues come back to stab it. The Buddha has an analysis of what he calls babancha. Sometimes that's translated as metal proliferation. But the way he talks about papancha, it's not a question of how much there is. When people talk about having a papancha attack, they say they just they got started thinking about a topic and they couldn't stop. But that's not what the Buddha's talking about. He's using the term in the sense of there are certain ways of thinking to yourself, certain terms that you use. They start out with the, the idea, the perception, I am the thinker. And you create that sense of who you are as a being. The being has to feed. You need your territory. And most beings want to expand their territory as far as they can. Anyone who moves in on their territory, there's going to be problems. So immediately you're creating the basis for conflict. As the Buddha said, that's where conflict comes from. It's this kind of thinking. Once there's the me and the I and the I am and I am the being, I've got to feed, I need food. You're going to run into other beings who are also looking for food.
This is one of the reasons why we pull inside. Because we realize that as we look for food in that way, those concepts we use come back and they stab us. He says they come back and they assail you. In his analysis, we start simply with a thought, and it's just a feeling. And then there's someone who thinks, someone who feels the feeling and then thinks about the feeling, and then gets involved in these concepts, and then they're assailed. So you want to look into the concepts that you hold on to. To what extent they, do they assail you? Do they cause you a lot of problems? Because as the Buddha says again and again, the things that other people do to us, do to us are nothing compared to the suffering we cause for ourselves. And so why are we so rough with ourselves? It's because we have other ideas where happiness will lie in defending our territory. So we look inside. And one of the reasons why we practice concentration is to cultivate some territory that's really ours, where there doesn't have to be any conflict. You focus on the breath. There's nobody who's going to be pushed out of the way who's already trying to look at your breath. It's totally yours to look at, your sense of the body that you feel from within. No one else can feel that. If you can find some well-being here. They didn't, you don't feel the need to go out and lay claim to things outside. What you want out of other people, how you want them to think about you, all those things, you just leave it alone. And John Lee talks about this again and again. The words of other people, that's their karma. The thoughts of other people, that's their karma. Your karma has to do with how you're looking for happiness and how responsible you are, and how wise you are. To what extent does your search for happiness create trouble for other people? To what extent does it create trouble for you? As long as you have no other alternative, you're going to resent these questions. But if you have this alternative inside, or simply by the way you breathe, by the way you allow the breath energy to go through the body, you can find some happiness. Then you can look at your other ways of looking for happiness outside, and you realize okay, that it causes a lot of trouble. And you begin to realize there are a lot of issues out there you just don't have to get involved in. Think of the Buddha. The big issues of his time had to do with the nature of the world was the world finite or infinite, eternal, not eternal. How about your identity? Where are you identical with your body, or are you something separate from your body? Those kinds of things. People would come and ask the Buddha, and they'd usually come prepared to argue with whatever of those positions he would take. And he always refused to take any position on those questions. And you see people feeling frustrated. They even accused him of not teaching anything at all. And as one of his students pointed out, though, no, the Buddha was very clear on one thing, what's skillful and what's not skillful. In other words, what leads to the end of suffering and what creates more suffering. That's the question that has to be asked. That's the question that matters. The Buddha was very harsh with people who would not answer that question. It's not the case that he wouldn't take a stance, or he praised people for not taking a stance on anything. He said you have to take a stance on what's skillful and what's not, because it determines how you act, and what kind of impact your actions are going to have on other people. That matters. But as for questions outside of that, why bother? And just turf battles over astroturf. In other words, you can't even eat the grass. So as you look for happiness inside, you look back at the world. This is why the Buddha had such compassion for the world. As he said, he, after his awakening, he looked around and he saw beings 
on fire, with the fires of greed, aversion, and delusion. He felt compassion, because he had been there, but now he was out. So that's how you have to treat people who are insistent on still getting into battles. You don't have to engage them in battles, but you do have compassion for them. That's how you can learn how to live in this world and not have to suffer from it. Because you're not looking for your happiness in the world. You're looking for it through the skills that you can develop inside.